Hello. I would like to welcome you all to a brave new world, meeting the global challenges of the 21st century, a conference formally inaugurating uh, the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Uh, my name is Jim Lindsay. I am the director of the center. Uh, and it's a very big day for us here. Uh, I want to let everybody know that the Strauss Center was made possible by a very generous gift by the distinguished UT alumnus, lawyer, and public servant, Ambassador Robert S. Strauss, and the law firm he founded, uh, Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld. Uh, and we want to thank the ambassador. Uh, Jim Langdon, uh, who is a partner in Aiken, Gump, and somebody who is and has been crucial to the center's founding. He's going to be joining us a little later. Uh, and we're very glad to have him here. Several other people are here today uh, who are crucial to the creation of the Strauss Center. It would take hours to detail for you everything uh, that they have done for us. Uh, suffice it to say uh, that without the, the dedication, the commitment, and most of all, the passion of Admiral Bob Inman, James, uh, Dean Jim Steinberg, Frank Gavin, uh, the Strauss Center uh, would not exist. So if you would join me, please, I want to say thank you very much to all of you. I'm also pleased uh, to note that uh, John Brumley uh, is here. And John has been a very kind friend of uh, the Strauss Center. I want to say thank you very much, John, for coming down here. So thank you very much. I also have come to appreciate over the years uh, that no conference ever happens unless there's some people who are willing to give up their sleep and put their personal lives on hold to make it happen. Uh, in our case, those two people are Jill Angelo and Laura Jones, and Frank Gavin and I consider ourselves blessed every day uh, to have the opportunity uh, to work with them, and we just want to say right now, thank you very much, Laura and Jill. <laughs> Laura and Jill are so dedicated to making everything work that they're not even here to get their appreciation. Uh, they are out uh, doing their work. Now, I want to take a few moments before we introduce the panelists to talk about the reasons for the Strauss Center, because uh, we're a new addition here to the University of Texas campus. We were created in recognition of the single fact that globalization is remaking the world as we know it. It is creating new sources of wealth and opportunity. The global economy is expanding, and once poor countries are emerging as economic powerhouses. But as we saw on September 11, 2001, globalization is also spawning new dangers and vulnerabilities. We see these problems in the daily headlines. Catastrophic terrorism, nuclear proliferation, killer epidemics like SARS and avian flu, climate change, and global financial panics, to name just a few. The Strauss Center was founded to provide the imagination, the leadership, and the innovation needed to help people understand how globalization is changing the world and to generate workable policy solutions that the public can embrace and that practitioners and policymakers can enact to meet the challenges we face. The Strauss Center proudly stands at the crossroads, so to speak, of the world of ideas and the world of action. We believe that we can accomplish our mission only by mobilizing experts across the University of Texas campus and by engaging the best minds in government, business, and the nonprofit world. The global challenges of the 21st century share a common characteristic. They are complex and multidimensional. That very complexity and multidimensionality means that finding solutions requires working with people across many disciplines and professions. The distinguished panelists who have joined us today from academia, government, and the private sector reflect the Strauss Center's bedrock commitment 
to bring to campus people with diverse perspectives and experiences. We intend to be a place where scholars and practitioners can meet for frank discussions on how to respond to the world's most pressing problems. We intend not to only do something exciting today, but also in the weeks and months to come. And if I may just throw in a shameless plug for an upcoming event, uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. over at the LBJ Library, uh, we are sponsoring a talk by Marina Ottaway of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, we invite you all to come. I would also let everybody know that you can find out more about our events and the projects we have underway at our new website, uh, www.robertstraussenter.org. Let me repeat that one more time, www.robertstraussenter.org. Now, like any new organization, uh, we have much to learn and to do. One thing we already know, however, is that the Strauss Center is blessed to be at a university with such a breadth and depth of talent. Uh, there is a lot you can teach us, and we welcome your ideas and thoughts on people to bring in, projects to pursue, uh, and events to hold. Now we recognize that the Strauss Center has a very ambitious agenda uh, ahead of it, uh, but I can assure you that we plan to do our part uh, to live up to the UT motto, what starts here changes the world. I'm going to stop now and, and change my hats and go from welcoming you to the conference to introducing you to our panelists. And uh, before I do that, there's a little bit of housekeeping I have to do, which is to say that anyone who has an officially approved electronic device, cell phone, Blackberry, or anything else that's likely to spontaneously erupt into a playing of the William Tell Overture or the latest hit by Stoop Doggy Dog, uh, if you could mute it uh, or turn it off, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Now, I am really honored to have the opportunity uh, to introduce today's uh, panelists. Uh, they have impeccable credentials uh, across a variety of, of areas to come and talk to us today about our topic of how globalization uh, is changing the world. And I'm going to do it in alphabetical order. So I'm going to begin with our panelist in the center, uh, Heidi Cruz. She is a graduate of Claremont McKenna College. She has an MBA from Harvard Business School. You're going to see a theme emerge in a little while on this score. She has an MBA from Harvard and a Master of European Business from the Free University of Brussels, which I believe is in Belgium. Test my geography knowledge. Uh, after working, am I right? Okay, very good. Uh, after working as an investment banker, she joined uh, the first administration of uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, she served in a variety of posts. She was special policy assistant to Ambassador Robert Zellick, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, she was director of the Latin America office at the United States Treasury. Uh, and she was a senior advisor to the Undersecretary of the Treasury. Uh, Heidi subsequently became uh, economic director uh, on the Western Hemisphere on the staff of the National Security Council under Dr. Uh, Condoleezza Rice where she was responsible for liaising with Latin American presidents, finance ministers, ambassadors, and central bank presidents on a variety of issues dealing with the economy and their interaction with multilateral uh, institutions. Heidi, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it is probably appropriate that I leave off introducing Heidi by talking about uh, multilateral institutions because our next panelist, uh, the Honorable Kristen Silverberg, is Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs. Uh, she is a graduate of Harvard University uh, and the uh, University of Texas Law School. She was a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, worked in private practice, joined the Bush administration, held an impressive array of uh, posts. You were first special assistant to the president uh, in the office of the chief of staff. In 2003, Kristen left and went to Baghdad to serve as an advisor uh, to L. Paul Bremer uh, on putting up an elected Iraqi government. Uh, Kristen returned uh, to Washington where she served in two key White House posts. First as deputy assistant to the president uh, for domestic policy and then as Deputy Assistant to the President and Advisor 
to the Chief of Staff. In August 2005, uh, she was sworn in uh, as a secretary, Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs. And for people who aren't familiar with the uh, setup of the State Department, uh, the Bureau IO, as it's called in the, in the, in the lingo, uh, handles U.S. policy toward more than 80 different international institutions, uh, in, uh, most notably the United Nations and its specialized agencies like the World Health Organization and the Food and Agricultural Organiz or Organization. And I should also point out that uh, Kristen has been recognized uh, by the University of Texas as one of its outstanding young uh, Texas exes. So congratulations on that. Our third panelist is well known to many of you. Uh, it's Dean Jim Steinberg, Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Jim is a graduate of Harvard College, uh, Yale Law School. He clerked at the US Court of Appeals uh, for the DC Circuit, worked on Capitol Hill, also served several places, uh, think tanks, notably at uh, RAND and at the prestigious International Institute for Strategic Studies. In 1994-1996, he was at the State Department as Director uh, of the Office of Policy Planning. Um, in 1996 until 2000, he was Deputy National Security Advisor to President uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, there are a number of people who, in Washington at a place called Brookings who are very thankful that uh, upon uh, ending that part of his government career, he came to Brookings where he was Vice President Director uh, of the Foreign Policy Studies Program. Jim has written numerous books and articles and book chapters on foreign policy and national security topics, uh, most recently authoring, uh, uh, co-authoring Protecting the Homeland 2006-2007. I want you to join me, I'd ask you all to join with me in thanking our panelists for coming here today. If I can get up. Now, our conference is entitled A Brave New World, Meeting the Challenges of the 21st Century. And this particular panel is called From International to Global, How Globalization is Transforming Our World. This title comes from a talk I heard Dean Steinberg give. So if you don't mind, I'm going to throw the first question uh, over to the dean. Uh, you know, as you have gone and talked about the evolution of the LBJ School and the whole startup of a new master's program, uh, you've been very emphatic that it's going to be a master's in global policy studies, not the more traditional name, the master's of, of international affairs. And you've rather eloquently talked about the reasons for that. So I was hoping maybe you could share with the audience here how it is that you see globalization remaking the world and why it's crucial to focus on the word global rather than international. Thanks, Jim, and thanks to everybody here, particularly you and Frank and Jill, for all the work you've done in making this a reality, and all the other people in the room, Admiral Inman, Mr. Brumley, and others who've played such a critical role in, in making this a reality. It's, it's really exciting for me to be part of this. And I have to say, as you were doing the introductions, Jim, it did strike me that there's a new motto, which is what starts at Harvard ends at UT. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also was struck when you said, well, the, the, panel is a, uh, the panel represents academia, the private sector, and the public sector. And I was thinking, where's the academic? And, uh, and then I realized that that was supposed to be me, which uh, still a slightly unaccustomed role. But I, I am very happy to be here. And I, I think that uh, the choice of panelists really reflects, uh, in part, the answer to the question that you've asked. If you think about the work that uh, Kristen was doing, that. Uh, uh, Heidi has been doing, uh, the way in which we think about the world in which the way the United States has to interact with the kinds of challenges that it has is, is profoundly transformed uh, from the good old days of uh, national security agendas, geopolitics, and the like. Um, it's, uh, it's often tempting when people say, what has globalization changed? The answer is, is everything. Uh, there's almost nothing that, that touches our lives, and particularly that touches the policy world, that isn't affected by this profound change in the international landscape, a, a change that's driven by uh, the, the tremendous uh, uh, global interconnections of our economy, the remarkable uh, transformations that technology, and particularly information technology, have brought, that have brought the world closer together, have shrunk distances, eliminated boundaries, uh, and really made every issue 
an issue which is a global in nature. Um, there's that famous old saying from the, the 60s, which is to think globally and act locally. Uh, we have to, everything local is global now. Uh, I teach course here, you know, and I start the course asking my students to try to think of a topic that doesn't have a global dimension. And it's, it's almost impossible to come out with it. You think about the traditional challenges like healthcare or education or jobs, they're all global. Everything that we do, it takes place in an international environment. And, and what that means is not just that there are a, a lot of different countries involved. I mean, that really is the difference. We're talking about phenomena which countries are a part of, uh, but there are a lot of forces and actors which transcend uh, that traditional notion of international as being involved with states. States now, rather than being the essential uh, and only building blocks of the system, are now just one part of a very complex uh, set of actors and forces that change the world. And uh, you said it well in your introduction. Uh, it, it is a, a set of changes uh, that have opened enormous opportunities. Uh, and I'm sure Heidi will talk about some of the great economic opportunities, but also uh, in bringing the world closer together uh, to increase diversity, to make the, the possibility for people everywhere to be exposed to new ideas and new opportunities. Um, you know, globalization is as much uh, sushi and kung fu movies uh, and uh, Pokemon as it is um, uh, the kinds of uh, things that we think about, about global financial and capital flows and things like that. It is an opportunity uh, for diversity to, to grow. Uh, if handled right, uh, people to be exposed to the best ideas, uh, and which is very uh, supportive of the kinds of values in our open society that we try to promote. But it obviously does bring with great dangers. The kind of the ability to use borders as a way to protect ourselves is increasingly uh, less uh, successful. And what that means is that we face a new set of challenges of trying to uh, take advantage of the benefits that globalization offers on the economic, political, social, and cultural fronts uh, and minimize these very serious risks, and they are enormously serious. I mean, the kinds of dangers that we face from terrorism, from crime, from drug trafficking, from environmental problems, from uh, transnational health issues are as serious as anything we've ever faced uh, in our history. And, and as powerful as we are, we have less capacity acting as a nation to do that. And we, it's less uh, powerful as a nation, one, because some of these forces are simply beyond what governments can do. And some are things where even if governments can do things, they can only be effective if they act together. And uh, I'm confident that Kristen will say a little bit about what it means to act together in this world and how uh, imaginative and innovative we have to think about uh, building these kinds of structures of cooperation, which include but aren't limited to governments uh, and, and are not limited to formal organizations, but, uh, but other ways of cooperating, again, to get the benefits of these uh, enormous positive changes while protecting ourselves against the risks. Terrific, Jim. I'm going to take you up on your offer to ask uh, Heidi a question. I, I realize that globalization is more than economics. It's Pokemon. It is Kung Fu movies. It is Dice K. Matsuzaka getting ready to pitch in Game 2 of the American League Division Series. But economic change is a big part of it. And uh, we talk a lot about how the global economy is changing. And, and I think in a little while we'll get to some of the consequences of that. But Heidi, I'm hoping you can sort of help me sort of understand what's actually happening. Because when I pick up, when I was preparing for today's panel, I went to the World Almanac, picked it up, and I read some fascinating facts. Uh, the volume of global trade has increased 28-fold over the last four decades. The amount of money in uh, foreign exchange markets over the past four decades has gone from 15 billion a day to two trillion dollars a day. Those are really big numbers. But I was hoping, maybe, given your experience, the various places you've worked, if you could sort of give us a handle on what's really happening in the global economy. Sure, it's a, it's a great question. And as I was thinking about the panel, I realized that the um, given my current work, the place where I'd probably be able to um, speak is not so much on international organizations, but more on what, kind of what do we see in the business sector and how has it changed the way that we work. And I would make a couple points in, in response to that. I think there is certainly a macroeconomic dimension to it that involves countries. Um, and that translates into market opportunities for investors. Um, and I think the probably best example of that is China. Um, but when we look at where there used to be pools of capital and kind of how markets used to work, the big money centers, if you will, uh, were New York and London. 
And as we look globally today, New York and London are no longer um, the only sources of capital. Uh, governments around the world are big sources of capital. And interestingly, we used to sort of differentiate in the capital markets between U.S. as being sort of a safe haven to invest and then the emerging markets being riskier um, locations and people st structured portfolios and all accordingly. And what we've seen is a lot of the emerging market countries have actually become such big actors in our trade markets. Can I just ask a question? Who do you define as emerging markets? Just so for people out there have a sense of... Sure. I mean, the, the countries that I'm thinking of are, are places like um, certainly a lot of countries in Latin America, um, even a, a Brazil. So I'm thinking kind of of uh, what have been termed, broadly speaking, as the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China are some of the largest. And then in the region that where I spent some years, all of Latin America really being an emerging market and, and much of Asia as well. And then you also can factor in sort of the Eastern European countries having also come into that fold. And some of the larger countries have actually become such large, large participants in the goods and services trade markets that they've built up a, a strong bevy of capital reserves at their federal reserves, their central banks. And they've now realized that capital is mobile and because there's so much information now given the internet, they have direct access to all the deals that we're seeing in New York and London and the U.S. And countries are actually putting big pieces of capital to work through these government funds to incre increase the return on investment. Prior to that, it was obviously mostly in fixed income type products. So you know, the, the most recent example of that that I'm sure everyone's read about that was extremely interesting on Wall Street was um, the Blackstone deal and China's kind of government fund interest in purchasing a piece of arguably one of our largest and most interesting IPOs this year. So then you have this kind of situation where you have companies that were private equity firms um, taking companies from being public to private taking itself public and being funded by China. Uh, and that's something that, you know, even in, you know, kind of 1990, 1994, those first years when I, when I first kind of came out of um, college and graduate school and all and started, started working on Wall Street, we just didn't see that. So I think, um, kind of in summary, new pools of capital that are really changing the way that, that deals get done. And, and capital wants to go where it can get the best return. And, and it now has the freedom to move. Okay. Um, greater, greater fluidity, I suppose. Greater fluidity. And, and I think you know, we, not, we now have greater capital convertibility as well. There used to be a number of countries that, that their currencies were not convertible. And that's still the case. We still have pockets of that. But um, they find a way to convert it when there's a good yield. <laughs> Very good. And Christian, let's sort of shift gears. I, I also want to draw out something that Jim said to the latter part of his uh, remarks about building structures of co cooperation. Uh, you run a very important bureau at the State Department, and I think I mentioned in the opening, uh, more than 80 different international uh, agencies or organizations or institutions and programs, however you want, we want to label them. It, it might sort of help us uh, sort of as a starter just for you to sort of explain what it is the bureau does and what that sea of institutions looks like. So most people think of international institutions, they just think of the United Nations, and that's the end of the conversation. And as you know well, it's a very long list. Yeah. Well, first, let me say thank you for having me here. I um, grew up here in Austin, and, and as Jim mentioned, I spent three really valuable years at the University of Texas School of Law, so I'm very proud that Austin is home to this important forum for discussion and debate, and you, you should be congratulated. Um, we work in the State Department with, in my bureau, with about 82 different international organizations, but administration ride with about 250. And these are organizations, you know, there's no generally accepted definition of an I.O., but the one we usually use is a multilateral institution, so one with at least three members, um, made up of governments, so something where um, governments, although sometimes private actors are represented, that's formed based on some kind of formal agreement between states. That definition encompasses everything from the United Nations and its specialized agencies to some very small and very discreet international organizations you've never heard of. Um, someone in my bureau focuses on an organization that deals with zoological issues. I don't even know what that means. Um, but, they, but it's very important to someone in the United States, and so we in the, in the State Department engage um, actively with our experts through that organization. We work with organizations like the World Food Program, which helps to feed about 100 million people a year all over um, Africa and Asia and Latin America. 
We work with the Food and Agricultural Organization, which deals with things like food safety issues. Um, organizations like the International Civil Aviation Organization, which helps to negotiate airline safety. Um, so these are the kinds of organizations that deal um, sometimes with very specific standard setting issues, sometimes with much broader political issues like the kinds of things you read about at, uh, regarding the United Nations Security Council. When I was thinking about this topic and the way that IOs relate to globalization, I guess one, one point that came to mind is that our international institutions really have been agents of globalization. They facilitated the kind of interconnectedness we see economically and politically and culturally. Um, all of there are obviously lots and lots of different causes of globalization, including technological development, um, the lowering of trade barriers, those kinds of things. But part of what has driven that is the ability to, um, of international organizations to facilitate cross-border transactions. Just you know, a couple examples. The Universal Postal Union, which was founded, is one of the oldest IOs, and it was founded after the invention of the telegraph. And that's what enables you to easily send a letter from Austin, Texas to Burkina Faso, if you want to. Um, the, the International Telecommunications Union, which is the thing that standardizes the way cell phones work, and that which lets you pick up the phone and call someone in, a, in Tripoli um, and talk on a cell phone. The International Civil Aviation Organization, as I said, which is the thing that gives travelers assurance that when they get on an airline in Doha, um, they at least know something about the safety record of that airline. So these are the kinds of things that have made interconnectedness easier um, and maybe move more quickly. Well, let me pick up on that theme, and I want to go back to something that, that Jim Steinberg said. Maybe I can press him a bit. Uh, Christian, you just sort of talked about how international institutions facilitate globalization, you know, among other things, by common standards, allowing people to sort of interconnect smoothly. Uh, Jim, as you know, there's sort of a, a segment in the academic world that would say, you know, wait a second with all of this globalization stuff, Pokemon's nice, Dice K's nice, let's take a deep breath, that before uh, World War I, we also had globalization, we had all these kind of interconnections, so there's two lessons here. One is, it ain't all that new, and it's not, it's not necessarily or inherently sustainable. How would you react to that? Well, it, it, it isn't completely new. Um, and it's certainly the case that if we were or 1910, we'd be talking about the remarkable changes in the world and the growth of global trade and, and all these wonderful technologies like the uh, telegraph and the steamship and, and the like, uh, and the, the, depending on the year we pick, the airplane. Um, that had transformed the world and it will never be the same again. Um, but I, and I mean, I basically uh, share in, in broad terms Tom Friedman's assessment about this, which is that this is, that this is, this is globalization 3.0 and, uh, and that this is, that each one represents a significant qualitative change uh, from the one that was before. And, and by far and away the most important part and the difference is digitization and information technology because it really has, in very, very important respects, ended space and distance as an important element. I mean, there is, the, the other shrunk it uh, in the sense that it reduced times and reduced distances, but now there's a, there's a common reality. Um, it isn't just, a, it is now at the speed of electrons that things happen, which is essentially simultaneous in every place. If you think about this, Heidi's talking about global markets, you now, there's just, markets don't open and close anymore because there's no, there's no reason to them. They're always open because the information is always available. Um, trade, which was limited to kind of things you could hold and make, is now trade in ideas and services and intellectual property, which does not need any borders to it. And the, the infrastructure of that change is denationalized. Uh, so if you think about the debate about surveillance that's taking place now in the United States and what are the right rules, there is no nationality. We used to have rules that talked about U.S. persons and things that happened in the United States. In the digital world, it's a total accident as to where those packets go. Uh, and, and there's no particular reason for them to have a nationality or identity. And so I think that this is qualitatively different. Um, is it irreversible? 
It doesn't mean it won't have setbacks. It probably will. And I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to my students about this. I can give you 20 good and plausible scenarios that would have a major impact and set back globalization dramatically, the most important of which, in my judgment, would be uh, either a massive pandemic uh, health uh, problem or a, a massive weapons of mass destruction terrorist attack in which borders would close, economies would be set back, we would become much more autarkic for a time. Uh, and, you know, I also say, look, you know, globalization 1.0 had some big setbacks. Think about the Dark Ages compared to the Roman Empire. This, this could last for even hundreds of years, depending on the consequences. But over time, I think these forces are unbottleable again. And so I think that the, the, the kind of transformations that we're talking about if in, in the straight line will continue. The straight line never happens, so there will be perturbations, maybe big ones. But I think that, that the, the, the broad factors we're talking about are ultimately here to stay. Well, let, let's just talk a little bit about those broad factors being sustainable. And I note that, that Heidi pointed about this sort of these large pools of capital that want to go places uh, where they, they can seek a return. And I'll, I'll I'll accept that that's the reality. Let me just ask you sort of the normative question. Is that good uh, that we have all of this capital uh, sort of sloshing around? Does it create new perils for us? Uh, I'm a subscriber, though not a dedicated reader of the Wall Street Journal. And all I know is that over the last year, they kept telling me that the housing market's in a bubble. It's going to burst. It's going to burst. Nothing happened. Then all of a sudden, somebody coughed or something, and, and markets went crazy. Then I heard, oh my god, it was going to spread, and the global economy was going to die. Best thing I know, uh, somebody in Washington gave a press conference, and it was all over, and now markets are going back up. So help me understand what it means to be in this global market with all this capital. Because I would sort of say, as an average person sort of walking, or walking down the street, wow, it seems to be working out quite well. Am I justified to be happy, or am I like the guy who jumped off the Empire State Building just past the 15th floor saying, so far, so good? Right, right. Uh, it's, it's a great question, and it's, it's been key, certainly not just for this summer, um, sort of a, what, what some are calling a real financial crisis that we've been through. But I think people have been asking this question for the last 10 years, really since the Asia financial crisis, when it was sort of brought to everyone's attention that there is quite a bit of contagion still left in the world. And how far does that spread? Um, and I, I think to, to kind of start with a conclusion, I think net, net, mm -hmm. it's a really good thing. Um, and, and why is it good? We're in a, I think this year is a perfect example. We're in a situation this year where we'll probably have below trend US GDP growth. Um, and in our past, the US has been kind of a, it's been a strong market. It's been a, a safe place to invest. And so people have, and, and it's been a, an economy of consumption, 70% 70, 70 of our GDP is consumption. Um, a very small part of it is savings, many years negative. And then there's investment um, and government spending. But we have really been a driving force globally for a long time but because of our consumption. Um, we are now facing a point where the U.S. is really slowing down and what is going to buoy growth this year and keep product and service markets um, very healthy and companies in the U.S. with strong earnings growth, meaning a strong stock market, um, which we've seen a relatively strong stock market so far this year, even given the summer, is global growth. There's a lot of consumption demand coming from some of these countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, that previously were somewhat of a drag on economic growth. Um, so I think net-net, it's, it's a real positive. One of the dangers, to kind of address um, the fact that there are real dangers and some setbacks, and I think this is a point that will stay with us um, permanently, is increased correlations. And that's what we saw this summer. And there is danger in that. Um, the reason- That's when good, good things happen here, good things happen there, but also bad things happen here, bad things happen right. there. Right, I mean, so cor of, right, it's a, it's a positive one or a negative okay. one relationship okay. or anything in between, but it shows that they are related in some, you know, some ratio. Uh, so, you know, the, the danger there is when, when uh, we had some bit of a subprime meltdown in the U.S., and this was really kind of triggered by reduction in, in housing prices. Uh, and then it very quickly became clear that it wasn't just that housing prices were declining in California, but that actually banks on Wall Street and in Brussels and in Frankfurt had invested in these very complex structures where the actual product was an, apart was an apartment in, you know, Costa Mesa, California. And so we saw, you know, we saw a bank almost go 
bankrupt in England that had to be bailed out because of, of this. And a, a bank in Germany did, did falter. So, you know, those kinds of things, I think, even by the capital markets, were not anticipated that, that it would have such an impact on European growth. Uh, and, and I think the, the interesting corollary to that is, unlike the Asian crisis, every economic setback has different lessons to be learned. The risk here in investors' minds was not emerging markets. It wasn't the countries that have political risk. The risk was in the U.S. Um, and it spread dramatically. And I, I believe some German uh, shareholders were very, very unhappy with, with what happened to their bank because of Americans borrowing too much money. But, uh, that, yeah, that's right. There's a, <laughs> there's a bit of an anti-American sentiment abroad. Yes. I, I, what you raise, Heidi, is interesting. It sort of poses a, a question for Kristen, which is when bad things happen on the international scene, uh, there's often an expectation that there's an international institution that can step in and handle it. Uh, that's true sort of on the security front, but also on the economic front, maybe it's the IMF or the World Bank. If you think of sort of concerns about uh, infectious disease, there's the hope that the FAO, can, not the, FAO the WHO will step in. Uh, you ably pointed out how a number of international institutions that aren't household names have helped midwife globalization. Uh, are international institutions ready for the big bump on the road in globalizations? Are they adapting? Well, um, I still think there's, I, I think it's clear there's a very important role for international organizations in dealing with some of these cross-border challenges. And everything that Heidi pointed out on the economic side, there's an analog on the non-economic side, the kinds of contagion you see, um, quick cross-border transmission of avian influenza, or the kinds of things we see in terms of drug, um, drug cartels operating across borders. Um, those are kinds of things where international organizations have a particular role to play because they can fill the space between states um, and operate in places where states have failed. Um, there are a number of them that do really essential work in those areas. WHO and FAO are some examples. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, but I think that there's a fundamental test coming for international organizations regarding how they respond to globalization. And that's how will they react to the threat that terrorist groups use the threat or the, um, the threat of globalization and take advantage of the opportunities presented by failed states to recruit um, and, and facilitate violent acts. How international organizations deal with that fundamental problem is really a test because what we see these days, and maybe the realization at the State Department post 9-11, is that the dangers the United States government is facing now are not primarily presented by strong states. They're primarily presented by weak states, by places where non-state actors can take advantage of weak governance um, to set up terrorist operations. And that's dealing with that challenge, the, the dangers of failed states, is something that international organizations are not um, always well designed to address for several reasons. One is that in the international system there's still the strong view for many states that you don't interfere in the domestic matters of a state and this is what we're seeing um, all over the news from the Chinese and Indians on Burma. Um, the, so there's still a sense that there's, uh, there's still a debate about the line between what's properly within the um, within international affairs and what's really a domestic matter. Um, and the second is that in many of these international institutions, the world's worst actors have disproportionate influence. They have far more influence at the United Nations than they do in the global economy, for example. And so there's an ability for some states, uh, not well-motivated states, to block the kind of action that we'd want to see. And, and we see that in Sudan. That's a, um, the role of some of, um, sort of some of people in carrying Khartoum's water for them and keeping this peacekeeping mission out. Um, so I guess I'd say there's still a very important role to play, and there are some organizations, especially the less political ones, that are, are playing a critical role, but there's a big test coming um, for international organizations. Let me yeah. be unfair and push you sure. a little bit more on this, because I, I, you put your finger on, I think, one of the really tough challenges, which is, you know, and Jim talked about in globalization, we need to build lasting structures of cooperation. To be fair to Jimmy, it was quite clear that it isn't just having international institutions of state to state. But to some extent, you have to have uh, international institutions where partner states come together. And you, you've quite ably pointed out that in some circumstances, we have a problem in that 
the values we hold and how we want to act are not held by other countries, so you're not going to want to cooperate. But we nonetheless feel that those issues are very important. Okay, can you, how do we sort of square that circle? Because a lot of people would say, well, if they, don't, if they don't want to work with us, the heck with them, we'll go off and do it our own way, which I think has its own sort of, how, how do we sort of think through that puzzle? Yeah, well, first, I, I certainly agree with Jim that the role of non-state actors um, is it's a much more important role in our diplomacy today. I think a lot about you know my bureau, the job I'm filling now, was first created in the aftermath of World War II um, for a man named Dean Rusk, who legendary diplomat, went on to be Secretary of State, and and there's been a lot written about that time. And the understanding of of international organizations at the time was that they would serve as a forum for states to get together. And the idea was that if we all sit in the room together and talk, then the major powers won't go to war. Um, and we realize, as I was saying now, that that's not the fundamental challenge. There really is very little risk of of major power conflict. There's a lot of risk from non-state actors. Um, so I certainly agree with that, with the importance of focusing on that. But it, that's not to say that states don't matter. They do fundamentally. In places where there are strong states, non-state actors play essential roles. But there's no substitute for a state. Um, there's nothing that can fill that gap in terms of um, of security, of protection of fundamental human liberties. Um, so the way we think about the challenge in the State Department these days is how do we turn all of our international institutions, um, our own diplomacy, international organizations, the efforts of others, to helping to strengthen governance, to strengthen states, um, and create the kind of, kind of mechanisms that can um, fill these ungoverned spaces. I think, you know, I still, I think there's room for there's room for um, a lot for the international organizations to do a lot in this area, but there are some fundamental challenges, and particularly fundamental challenges when you're dealing with universal organizations like the UN that, as I said, are, are frequently dominated by bad actors. Fair enough. I, I said yeah. it was an unfair question, so I want, I want to reiterate that. Uh, I, I'm glad you didn't ask me the question in return. So, the, Jim, I want to go back. I want to take one more run at you on globalization and sustainability. Because as I was listening to Heidi talk, I, again, I keep thinking of these pools of capital. All of a sudden, I, I see myself stuck in an auto dealership, and I'm forced to watch Lou Dobbs. And he's railing uh, on this. And, and uh, what I also note from watching Arbitron ratings is that his ratings have gone up since he's talked about the dangers of globalization. It's undermining the American economy. This is not a blessing for the United States. Uh, is globalization uh, sort of compatible with our political system, or do we run into a big hiccup there, both because of fears on the economic front, but also because of fears that it's creating new geopolitical challengers, most notably China? Well, I mean, it's, it's complicated. And, and there, the classic problem that there are winners and losers, um, that it's easy from an economic theory perspective to talk about, you know, Pareto superior moves and all that good stuff and how greater wealth is created. But the fact is that without interventions to deal with the, the pain that the losers feel and, to, and find ways to spread the gains so that, that there isn't a, a separate pool of winners and losers. Uh, the people who will be highly motivated tend to be the losers. Um, it, it was big, uh, remembered in the Clinton administration that one of the, kind of the, the great insightful moments uh, was when uh, then Secretary of Treasury Larry Summers uh, said to President Clinton, Mr. President, when you're talking about globalization, talk about consumers. You know, remind people they're consumers. Um, uh, and this is an important dimension because we are enormous beneficiaries uh, of this. And people, fr they think of themselves in their parts of their life, like their jobs and, and the like, which are very affected and less in the other uh, dimensions. And the nature of politics obviously tends to aggregate uh, those uh, issues of pain. They tend to often be geographically mm -hmm. concentrated, although the outsourcing and offshoring of services and the digitization has now made that a, a more complex uh, economic picture. Uh, but I think it is, it is true that it's easier to mobilize uh, around uh, the harms. Uh, and, but we've had this a lot. I mean, it, it, you know, we, I remind everyone you know, that for all the uh, uh, Sturm und Drang about China now, it sounds very much like what we talked about Japan in the, in the mid and late 80s, uh, when we were bashing you know, Japanese TV sets on the steps of the Capitol and, and the like. And, and the good news is that um, although there are concerns at the margin, that, that there is actually a fairly sustainable um, uh, support 
if not for going forward more dramatically and, and sort of rethinking this to not really turning back the clock. For all the talk, we're not going to repeal NAFTA. We're not going to pull out of the WTO. And, and so I think that there is a recognition that we have to look at these things. I think the key um, is to deal with these equity and distribution issues. I mean, I think the challenge now for domestic American policy is to decouple all the consequences of uh, the Schumpeterian destruction that comes with globalization from everything that you have. So that's why we talk about portability of health insurance. That's why we talk about wage insurance and issues like that, which need, which absolutely have to be part of this. So in terms of political sustainability, we just have to change the agenda. If everything turned on your job, then it's understandable why people would see this as hugely damaging. Uh, but if you had uh, wage insurance, if you had good retraining programs, if people understood that their, their livelihood, their, their economic and, and, and personal uh, security was not going to be threatened, there might be a, a broader sense of, of understanding that this is a broader game. I, I want to pick up on that, and if I get you to jump in here, Heidi, because uh, you, Jim sort of talked about how economists tend to drain the emotion, the lifeblood out of issues when they talk about it. Uh, you know, the, the old notion is when somebody else loses their job, it's a dislocation cost. Uh, when you lose your job, it's a catastrophe. And, and I'm struck, as an, again, I pick up, you know, I'm an occasional reader of the Wall Street Journal, and I pick it up, and it, it just seems like lots of bad news. Uh, I went to school in the, in the great state of Michigan, which seems to be coming apart uh, at the seams, and there, if you read the Detroit Free Press or the uh, Detroit News, the news is all bleak because sales at Ford are down 26 percent, they're down 18 percent at, at GM, and this big sort of flattened world of Tom Friedman, they're getting their lunch eaten. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, since I recently bought a new car and I drove some of their products, I can see why uh, they're getting their, their lunch eaten. So, which creates political stresses, and, and my sense is sort of the political bargain Jim talks about works if people feel on net that they're actually going to benefit, benefit from it. So what I really want to ask you is not to tell me why GM and Ford are struggling. I think that's pretty obvious. But what sectors of the American economy are doing well? Are there companies out there that are doing well, that are thriving in this global environment, that are sort of uh, can be emulated in a sense? I mean, what, are the, what are the good news stories as opposed to the mm -hmm. doom and gloom stories? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'll start a little bit broader and then can kind of talk, you know, sector specific or, in, or companies. But I think the I couldn't agree more with with your comments. And you know, I think this is it is somewhat of a broad economic question. You always run into everything from theory to practice, which is there are long term and short term consequences in finance and in in, in economics. And you know, I think the the long term consequences are, are quite good. The short term ones can have some some rough paths along the road. Um, the thing that I think is important for all of us to to sort of drive home as we are in all of our worlds, whether it be government, private sector, and, and academics, uh, is what incentives are in place with globalization, and is that a good thing for companies, um, for families, uh, for for individuals, you know, for communities? And that I think is the the greatest selling point of globalization is the incentives. When I when I look at them, you know, you can ask yourself, what is globalization? Um, and around the world, the longer term result of it is a higher standard of living. Uh, and why is that? It really requires that people become educated. Um, and if that means a sector shift with job relocation programs or um, education training programs, we talked about that extensively and had extensive programs for that when I was working with Bob Zellick on trade issues. And it's a critical issue. And I think, unfortunately, the proponents of globalization don't focus enough there. And the antagonists um, sort of focus only on the negatives, and there's kind of a disconnect in between, and it's, it's our responsibility to, to match those. Um, but it, it requires people to be educated, for one. Um, it, it requires companies to compete, uh, and that has the result of lowering prices. We have inflation in the U.S. right now of, on a core level, this is sort of excluding energy and food prices, which are quite volatile, of about 1.8%. That is phenomenal. You know, we, many in this room remember, you know, decades ago when that was unheard of. That is largely due to globalization. And what kind of companies? Um, companies like Walmart. Uh, and in the news today, there were articles about Walmart, front page of the journal, um, being squeezed because it even is facing increased competition for, for its pricing policies. When we look at sort of what companies 
will likely, you know, do well in spite of slow U.S. growth. That really gets to, I think, the core of your question. There are a lot of retailers. Um, you take companies like a Walmart who will, who will still do well, um, you know, Target. Some of the higher end retailers may get hit a little bit because they tend to be more um, luxury goods than pure staples many, but a lot of consumer staples are global. You take something like Crest toothpaste. Mm -hmm. You can buy that anywhere in the world now. People will continue to spend money for that. Um, I venture that Starbucks will probably continue to do well. Okay. Let me, let me so ask black you, coffee. Okay. Um, let me ask a question. I don't mean to be facetious about this, but should I be worried that you didn't list anything that we build? No manufacturing, no something I can touch and... Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know a lot about that no. sector, so no. I'd want to go actually look okay. at it and see if those companies are doing well. I think home builders are not doing well sort of right. this year broadly, but commercial builders globally are doing quite well. And so you kind of have to dissect. Um, and I, you know, you mentioned the car companies. Um, some of the, the car companies like GM actually mm -hmm. has, has had a lot of labor issues obviously in the last couple of weeks, but their stock price has done well once they resolve some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And I think they're doing a lot of things to compete better. Um, and so, you know, when we look at our stock market, there's, you know, thousands of companies that are part of that index. And that index continues to rise because those companies' earnings are rising, and they're rising because there's demand abroad. Okay. Uh, Kristen, I want to ask you actually varying the question uh, for Heidi, which is we talk about needing in international institutions. They've helped midwife this. But there is there is a political carrying capacity. In a lot of parts of the United States, people don't like international institutions. They see them as sinister. And you've pointed out quite eloquently some reasons why you could be skeptical of some institutions. So my question is, uh, and I think it, and as Jim pointed out, uh, with, with things like NAFTA, there's a whole clientele that makes their living off of beating up on that and we can list a whole bunch of other organizations. Uh, you're the public face of the State Department on, on some of these issues. What are the arguments you make to people to sort of to convince them that these things aren't all bad, that there are actually benefits uh, for the United States and Americans in them? Yeah, well, I should say I don't unapologetically defend um, every international organization or U.S. participation in it. Um, in fact, I've been, you know, one of the advocates in the U.S. government for not participating in international organizations when it requires, in my view, too fundamental a compromise of U.S. values. So the Human Rights Council in Geneva is one in particular that, that I've argued we should not participate in because um, it spends most of its time um, bashing if I can use that word, Israel, and very little of its time helping people living under oppressive governments. Um, but these are matters of a very serious debate. What I try to point to are the kinds of organizations that are doing really important on the ground operational work um, or the kind of work that can give rise to um, progress in alleviating poverty or fighting disease. So the kinds of organizations that focus on what they do rather than on what they say um, these are ultimately political bodies, and they, for the ones that are larger, closer to universal, there will always be things coming out of them that, um, that don't reflect U.S. policy, but they still can play, can be very important partners to us for all the reasons I talked about. Um, you know, one important mm -hmm. point related to what Heidi was saying about some of the political, um, political problems with globalization we see in many other countries related partly to economics and a lot to cultural issues. Because if you're in the US, globalization means being connected with people in other parts of the world. But if you're in a developing part of the world, globalization means being run over by American culture. And so we see an effort to use international organizations to try to put the brakes on globalizations at some points. Um, a cultural diversity convention to try to protect indigenous cultures from foreign influences, um, this kind of thing. And so, so we, d we deal with the domestic politics of globalization and IOs, even from other governments. Jim, can I uh, yep. just, just livening things up, talk a little bit? Because I think, uh, you know, uh, Kristen's right to raise issues like the Human Rights Council. But I, I think it is an important challenge as we think about globalization and the United States' role in it. I mean, there's no question that the Council is a joke and it's, uh, and it's badly constituted. And it, but the question is, you know, can we afford 
to say, well, at some point, you know, we, you know, we just don't like how other people decided and we're going to stand out. Because I think that it, precisely because it doesn't do anything, um, you know, one has to wonder whether even if we have to stand up and be the only vote, uh, that we shouldn't be there uh, to talk about these things. And I think there's a risk because of the nature of the international system that if we only participate where we decide that the institution uh, meets you know, what we think are minimum standards, that others are going to see this as a kind of a selective participation. And I think the big challenge for the United States is uh, one of trying to understand how do we work in a world in which we are enormously influential, by far more influential than anybody else. Uh, and that has great opportunities, but it also leads others to react against us. And, and, and how we show a certain amount of humility in this context to be part of it. Um, again, I don't think we should, we should pretend or somehow mute our voice in these kinds of institutions because it is just it is a tragedy after the whole discussion about reforming the old Human Rights Commission that we ended up with something uh, that is as uh, appalling as what they came up with. But I, I do think that to some extent we, we give our opponents an easy shot by not being part of it. And so I understand the arguments that, that Chris and others have made, but I think part of what we need to do is convince others that um, that we understand that people do have different views about globalization. We went through this whole debate in UNESCO many, many years ago, and we pulled out. We didn't like it. And it was, it was the same kind of thing. It was horrible. I mean, it really was. If we, there probably aren't too many people here who remember just what a ridiculous kind of classic uh, non-aligned movement platform it was for. But did we really do ourselves any good by coming out of it? I mean, it's, it's one question about whether you're going to sort of fund projects, which I think is, is there you can say, to the, should the American taxpayers have to fund something that other people think is worthwhile? And that was part of the problem with UNESCO. But I think where it's a question of, of sort of trying to understand that we don't just you know, take our marbles and go home and we don't like the result, is, is it going to be important for our leadership going forward? You want to? Yeah. Yes, and I, I, think, I think that's exactly the debate, and they're all Legit, very legitimate points. Um, I always think of UNESCO as an example for how, um, actually, how the U.S. can um, focus its attentions in a way that makes sure our engagement in international organizations is designed to be as productive as possible. You know, we spend about seventy million dollars a year at UNESCO, and so there's a real cost. Our decision whether to participate or not participate is, has a fundamental cost for our ability to engage in other effectively in other international organizations. I was part of the decision to go back into UNESCO um, at the beginning of this president's administration, and that was reasonably controversial at the time because we'd had such a bad experience in the past. But what we found is that by staying out for a period, we were able to use our commitment to join as a way to leverage some changes at the organization. And, you know, I was thinking one of the, we had some Israel um, problems at UNESCO too, and just this last week I went and New York with the Director General to a, an event at the Simon Wiesenthal Center where we, um, on anti-Semitism, and it was a real, a very public demonstration from him that he intends for Israel to get a fair shot at UNESCO. Um, and it, anyway, I see the point. I do think we have to think U.S. participation inevitably <coughs> lends credibility and legitimacy to bodies, and we have to think about how we use that very carefully, um, and we have to think we ha there are costs, in every case, there are costs to where we decide to commit our attentions, and we really ought to think of this not really from the perspective, from our perspective, but, but from the perspective of somebody living under the government of Burma or somebody living in um, Darfur and what would be most helpful to them. Okay, you've thrown a lot of really good ideas out on the table. What I'd like to do now is to bring the uh, audience into this. If you would have a question for our panelists, we have a mic here. You could come over and, and use it. That would be great. Otherwise, I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> and if you could identify yourself, that would be sure. great. My name is, my name is Joey Shaw, this one. And I'm an LBJ student, also in Middle East Studies here. Um, I have a question for Ms. Silver, and it's a bit more specific. Um, do you have successful ascendancy of things like the Islamic Development Bank and uh, other kind of calls from the Muslim world for greater cooperation on the international scale between Muslim countries, such as Paul we heard recently, for uh, a free trade agreement between Muslim, Muslim countries. I'm wondering if you see a future, or what future do you see for greater cooperation between Muslim countries on an international organizational scale? 
Do you mean, sorry, between, but in, between. In, within the Islamic world or between the U.S. and the well, Islamic I, I world? Mean between is, within the Islamic world, uh, also with U.S. I, mean, I think I see, you know, that other panelists may have a different perspective, but within or, international organizations, I actually see a lot of cooperation with the OIC countries, and in fact, they operate as a pretty powerful block. And I, I attribute most of the problems we're having at the Human Rights Council exactly to that. They, they vote cohesively on every single issue. And our block, we and the Europeans and the Canadians don't. And so, so actually I see, them, um, I see them working very effectively as a unit. We've thought a lot in the State Department about how we can better engage with the OIC because this is going to be a, cri it's critical that we do it partly because we have to send the right signal to the Islamic world about our our willingness to engage with them, and partly because, as a practical matter, we're going to have to if we're going to, if we're not going to get our, um, you know, uh, we're not going to get run over um, constantly by, by OIC coordination. Jim, I want to come back to something you opened up with, and you, I'm sorry, do you want to ask a question? Oh, oh God. No, I insist. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'm trying to be a polite host. Uh, my name is Andrew Rauch. I'm an undergraduate here at UT. I study government. And I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, thank everybody who made this Rauch possible and thank everybody who have at the university. Okay, thanks. Um, Okay, and also, uh, I'm also a part of the Central Texas Model UN Conference we do here at UT, so I can't tell you how proud I am to see an Austin Knight and a Longhorn uh, in the Bureau of International Organizations. Um, I just sort of wanted to ask, I guess, traditional international relations theory kind of focuses on the role of states as the primary actors uh, and as unitary actors uh, in kind of an anarchic system. Um, and, of course, you know, traditional realists or liberals try to um, work with that or the role that international organizations can bring to bear on state behavior. And I think uh, globalization, depending on how you define it, uh, has sort of thrown that into a dilemma and you kind of have to look at it uh, in new ways, uh, depending on how you define globalization, I guess. Um, but mostly we heard uh, from Mr. Steinberg about um, the rise of non-state actors and the power they can bring to bear. Um, and of course states have to reconcile that. At the same time, uh, international organizations have to reconcile that. And uh, Ms. Silverberg spoke about um, a kind of coming challenge for international organizations in terms of uh, this globalization's rise of non-state actors. And I was wondering uh, how you feel uh, international organizations uh, can, can reconcile with that. Um, so that's a really long question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, and you might want to hop in some more on this. Um, the, Generally, the posture we take is to welcome the involvement of NGOs and other um, constructive non-state actors in debates and international organizations because, especially in parts of the world where we're dealing with weaker or less responsible states, it's critical that we have, we have their perspective. You know, I, just as an example, in the Human Rights Council, we're about to undertake this periodic review where every country in the world is going to have their human rights record investigated and we've made it a point of principle that NGOs, the information that NGOs bring to the table has to be a big part of that discussion. So generally we have this, um, you know, this general posture. But as I was saying earlier, that isn't to say that we don't think states matter anymore. They do fundamentally matter and a lot of the buzzword we use in um, the State Department these days is transformational diplomacy, which is how do we commit all of our attentions to help strengthening the institutions of governance um, because it still seems to us that the fundamental danger we face is this, this problem about ungoverned spaces. Um, ungoverned spaces in Africa, um, in the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, these are the places where we're really trying to focus our attention and that really can only be, can be done with a lot of sort of development of the institutions of civil society but fundamentally it requires a government in place um, that can enforce security and the role of law and all of these things. I mean, it's, it is a complicated question. I, one of the first, uh, my own first experience with international organizations is I participated in 1985 in a um, uh, meeting of the um, uh, MPT review. And I was an advisor to an NGO. 
Um, and the NGOs played an incredibly important role in the NPT review conferences because one, they had a lot of expertise. Uh, and very few of the delegations, other than a few very important countries like the United States, had similar kinds of expertise. So one, they brought a lot of knowledge to the table. Two, um, they brought the ability uh, to basically legitimate some of the decisions uh, to a set of actors who might not take the actions of governments per se as legitimating, in part because you know some people don't like the governments, in part because some of the governments themselves are questionably legitimate, right? And we have a lot of governments that are non-democratic. And so having uh, NGOs as part of it and seeing the process as fair and comprehensive and views being considered tends to make the thing uh, politically more acceptable. And then, although it not entirely true in, in the NPT conference, but certainly in some of the other ones that, that Kristen was talking about. They actually the actors who are out there doing things in a lot of these places. And so they become an important agent of the ability, even if the states have made some decisions, that they become important, particularly on the humanitarian side there, indispensable. There's just no way that governments are going to do, or even IOs as IOs are going to do all this stuff. So um, over time, I think people have come to sort of see that this is, one, you couldn't keep them out. You know, just be hard to, to explain it. But two, it's actually done right. Um, it can be uh, important. It's interesting, you know, who's in favor and who's against. The United States has actually historically been pretty good about NGOs being in. You get other countries, very sovereignist countries like Mexico, who are totally opposed to it. I mean, their view is the international system is based on states that every time there's a meeting of an international organization that people want NGOs to be there, they're at the parapet saying, no, 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 it's illegitimate, even though it's, you know, you know, seen in other respects as having very progressive policies. So it's not, it's still a debate in the international system about, you know, how, I mean, what are their legitimacy? They're self-appointed groups, they've defined their own agenda. Who are they to, to have a voice and, you know, how do you decide they don't have votes, they don't get to have their membership vote on what they're going to do. So it, it, we have a very mixed system now, but, but I think over time as a practical matter, we've seen that there are a lot of advantages to their being part of it. Can I just ask a factual question on that? Who decides which non-governmental organizations get to be part of this? Because when you think of American domestic politics, you have a grassroots movement, and if it injures somebody's uh, important interest, they go out and create their own advocacy, advocacy group. It's sometimes referred to as astroturf lobbying or what have you. I mean, I, I, if you were to list some NGOs, I'd know who the virtuous are, ones are, and I'd say, oh, yes, by all means, invite them. But what prevents sort of non-virtuous NGOs forming whose purpose it is just to block what it is you want the international organization to do? Um, it depends entirely on the accreditation rules of the particular international organization. Our general posture is when an NGO, an American NGO wants, or any NGO wants to be accredited to um, a UN body like ECOSOC, um, which deals with economic social issues, our general view is unless there's some really compelling reason not to. Um, we voted against some NGOs that had pro-pedophilia um, well, bylaws, that kind of thing. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't what I had specifically in mind, it's, um, but it's still ballpark. <laughs> this doesn't come up regularly, thankfully, okay. but the, um, it, say, I mean, with the exception of something like that, we generally have a very open accreditation policy. But there are lots of countries that use accreditation politically. So, for example, if there's any NGO that comes up with the name Taiwan anywhere in the title, you can guarantee there will be a Chinese infection. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I'm Trampas Crow with the Center for Politics and Governance at the LBJ School. We've talked a lot today about economic globalization, and that's certainly important. And we, as a government, it seems like we spent a lot of time and energy on economic globalization. And we touched a little bit on cultural globalization. Considering that certainly in our relations between the West and the United States and the Middle East, cultural globalization is where there's the most tension, where our culture is very prevalent to certain underrepresented groups like women or perhaps Turkmen Kurds. Um, it's very appealing, but it's not at all appealing to those in power globally. Do we spend enough time trying to manage and influence cultural globalization? And if not, What's the best way to, to do that? Is it through State Department and governmental organizations, or is it through IOs and NGOs? Can I ask an addendum to that? Can you manage cultural globalization? I'm not having much success in my household, which is why I, I, I was going to add, as the, the panelist most unqualified to address that question, um, should we? Should we be managing <laughs> cultural globalization? You don't want to take a crack? I mean, first of all, I think it's important to remember there are two sides to this question. I mean, globalization has made Al Jazeera possible 
as well as you know Coca-Cola and all of that other stuff. And 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 to some extent, I would argue that that we, you know, I know the surveys are not too positive about the state of American education, but there, there's there's more opportunity for for us to be aware of other cultures. Uh, as opposed to the past, where it really was much more one way, in which a lot of American culture was being exported, but it was much harder for the others to get there because, because you know, kind of culture followed the, the economic stuff, and so we had this sort of Coca Colaization, McDonaldization. But I actually think that there is, that, that it, it, is, it is more of a two way street than people tend to give credit for, and that people complain about the, the part where it, you know, the other guy's culture lands in and crushes you out, and the French, you know, worry about our, their movies and things like that. But in fact, um, you know, you certainly see, I mean, it's quite remarkable in Asia in particular, the, the, the pluralization of culture. And it's had a huge impact, by the way, because, I mean, you know, although there are still important political uh, uh, conflicts between, and historical ones between Japan and Korea, and Japan and China and stuff like that. But actually, the young people, you know, they know each other's culture. They, they see the movies. They watch the soap operas. There is a, a lot more sort of appreciation of the kind of the non-government and political side. So first, I would say that it, it just it's important to get a, a, a more balanced picture of it and not to see this as just American culture going out and crushing everybody else's. Um, but second, I think that there's a separate question between, you know, the, what sensitivity government should show with trying to manage the sort of the question about, you know, are we, should we then try to interfere with this? I mean, I think, you know, there, first of all, it is almost impossible to do. Um, I, uh, I cut my teeth a little bit on um, a very understandable uh, preoccupation in France with um, not having pro-Nazi uh, memorabilia, uh, programming, content uh, broadcast, and of course, you know, since TV doesn't matter anymore, but the internet does, they tried to stop it being sold on Yahoo. Well, you know, it's hard. I mean, because it is everywhere. And it's, you know, you have one nation saying, well, this is a piece of culture that we don't like, but others have different rules and different laws. So I think it's, I think it, you know, there are some downsides, there's no doubt. Um, but I think that uh, while governments need to show sensitivity in their own stuff, I think it would be hard to think about strategies that actually try to reach into the, the rest of this and, and try to get a policy on it. Do you want to jump in, Kristen? No. Okay, well, I think we have come to the uh, close of our time. Right. Please join me in thanking the panelists for an excellent and stimulating set of remarks.